And now I'd like to introduce Professor Susan Wessler, our Home Secretary, to in turn introduce this year's Public Welfare Medalist. And Susan will also describe a little bit about the significance of this award. Susan. The 2016 National Academy of Science Public Welfare Medal is awarded to Alan Alda, actor, director, screenwriter, author, and science communicator. The Public Welfare Medal, which was established in 1914, is the highest honor of the National Academy of Sciences and is pre presented annually by the Council of the Academy in recognition of distinguished contributions in the application of science to the public welfare. The citation for Alan Alder reads as follows. For his extraordinary application of the skills honed as an actor to communicating science on television and stage and by teaching scientists innovative techniques that allow them to tell their story, stories to the public. So I'm going to give a bit of a background. I have a little bit of time to, a little bit more time for an introduction and, and uh, Alan Alda, um, our honored guest, has a little bit of, uh, hopefully a lot more time uh, to speak to all of us. So Alan Alda is a native New Yorker. His acting career on television, film, and stage spans more than five decades. For 11 years, as we all know, he played Hawkeye Pierce on the classic TV series MASH, winning seven Emmy Awards for acting, writing, and directing. He also appeared in continuing roles on ER, The West Wing, and 30 Rock. He has starred in, written, or directed more than 30 films, including Aviator, for which he was nominated for an Academy Award. On Broadway, he received Tony nominations for Glen Gary, Glen, Gary, Glen Ross, Jake Swimmin, and The Apple Tree. His role as science communicator is equally distinguished. As host of PBS's Scientific American Frontiers from 1993 to 2005, Alda interviewed hundreds of researchers about new discoveries in science, technology, and medicine. Alda also hosted two miniseries for PBS, The Human Spark, which explored what makes humans unique, and Brains on Trial, which examined how neuroscientific data from brain mapping technology could be used as evidence to inform the court system. On Broadway, Alda appeared, appeared in QED as physicist Richard Feynman. He also wrote the play Radiance, The Passion of Marie Curie, and Dear Albert, a reading for the stage of Einstein's letters. Alda's passion to help scientists communicate with the public led to the establishment in 2009 of the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University's School of Journalism, where he is also an assistant, uh, assistant, haha, uh -huh. <laughs> a visiting professor. Alda and the center have trained thousands of scientists through workshops and around the country. In 2011, Alda wrote a guest editorial for Science Magazine that led to the Flame Challenge, an annual international competition through which scientists answer a question in a way that is most appropriate for 11-year-olds. Entries are judged by thousands of fifth and sixth grade school children around the world. And if you haven't looked at the website, I really advise you to. The questions that have been answered over the last couple of years, the first is, what is a flame? Then, what is time? What is color? What is sleep? And this year, it's what is sound. And they're really, really enjoyable. Alda has won numerous awards, including the 2010 Kavli Science Journalism Award, the National Science Board's Public Service Award, and the Scientific American Lifetime Achievement Award, and the American Chemical Society Award for Public Service. In 2014, he was named a fellow of the American Physical Society for his work in helping scientists improve their communication skills. I'm going to end with two very different things. First, in addition to welcoming Mr. Alda, I also have the privilege of welcoming a significant contingent of his family. One of his three daughters, Elizabeth Ohini, son-in-law Bill Ohini, and granddaughter Eleanor, who Alan told me he calls Ellie. I, well, she probably calls herself Ellie. He doesn't have to. <laughs> I also extend a very special welcome to his wife of almost 60 years, Arlene Alda, an accomplished musician, photographer, and children's book author. Her latest book uh, is an autobiographic book called Just Kids from the Bronx, which caught my attention as I am a fellow kid from the Bronx, um, as some of you may be able to tell from my accent. <laughs> 
Second of all, I had the good fortune to participate in an Alder workshop here at the NAS building in July. After that experience, I was curious to understand how he learned to communicate so effectively. To find out, I read his book, Never Have Your Dog Stuffed, and other things I've learned. <laughs> and there on page 274, I found what I was looking for. And this is a bit of an extended quote, but I think it's worth it. At first, on stage and in life, I didn't really know what relating was. And listening was more a kind of waiting than anything else. I talk, and then you talk. And then I listen for when I get to talk again. <laughs> But relating, I came to understand, happens not just while I'm talking. It also happens while you're talking and in between. When I started out as an actor, I thought, here's what I have to say. How shall I say it? On MASH, I began to understand that what I do in the scene is not as important as what happens between me and the other person. And listening is what lets it happen. It's almost always the, always the other person who causes you to say what you say next. You don't have to figure out how you'll say it. You have to listen so simply, so innocently, that the other person brings about a change in you that makes you say it and informs the way you say it. The difference between listening and pretending to listen, I discovered, is enormous. One is fluid, the other is rigid. One is alive, the other is stuffed. Like his dog. <laughs> Eventually, I found a radical way of thinking about listening. Real listening is a willingness to let the other person change you. When I'm willing to let them change me, something happens between us that's more interesting than a pair of dueling monologues. Like so much of what I learned in the theater, this turned out to be how life works too. And relating is what Alan has brought to his 700 interviews with scientists, and relating is what he and his center teaches scientists to do with the public, the media, politicians, and young children. It is with my great pleasure to welcome this year's recipient of the 2016 Public Welfare Medal, Alan Alda. Astonishing this honor is to me. It's it's just I hope it's probably astonishing to you too. But I want <laughs> I want to explain a little bit of you know. I, I, first of all, I must I must say why I think this is so important because not just that my name is on that scroll, which oh, which is really nice, <laughs> but that it's a recognition of how important the communication of science is. I'm so glad that you're establishing this recognition. You, you really, are, the National Academy is working toward it. The project on trying to understand the scientific basis of science communication is one of your very important projects, and I'm so glad it's happening. But I must say, I must share this wonderful honor with the dedicated, creative, indefatigable team that makes up the Alda Center for Communicating Science. I'm so, I'm so proud to be a part of that group. We've trained and worked with, in workshops of the kind you just heard about, 7,000 scientists, and many of them, some of them are in the room today, and it makes me very thrilled to know that. But let me talk for a minute about relating. A lot of people wonder why an actor would be interested in communicating science, and that's what it is, it's relating, which is, probably the essential tool for an actor. The essential tool for an actor is not being able to remember all those words or to speak those words trippingly on the tongue. Those things are important, but really at its basis, the essence is to be able to relate to another person, another actor, so that what happens in that person's eyes, what happens in that person's voice has such an effect on me that regardless of how much we've rehearsed it, it comes out in a different way. There's something spontaneous that happens that brings this moment to life. And life is what we come to the theater for. We don't, want, we don't come for information on how they figured out 
how the character is played. We come for life. Let me, let me give you an example of how, how important I think this is. It, it, because it's not something that only actors can do. We all can do it to our benefit. And I think that this relating that I'm talking about that takes place on stage between actors is really at the heart of communication. The very heart of it. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. A few days ago, at the White House Science Fair, a, a nine-year-old boy presented his exhibit, which was a replica of the White House and uh, a wand for blowing bubbles. And he had ingeniously constructed these using a 3D printer in a special way. But after he showed his exhibit, he spoke with President Obama and he made an impassioned plea for an idea of his. How about, he said, how about if we ask children to advise the president on the best ways to promote innovation? <laughs> and I thought that was touching. And what I thought was touching in, a, in addition to that was the president listened to him and said it was a good idea and that he was going to look into doing that. Because, and this is the part that was not just touching, but I think kind of important. He said, because understanding children's explanations of what interests them is a way to shape our STEM education. The idea of listening to what somebody is interested in before you try to teach them something is an ancient idea, and yet it's still a revolutionary idea. <laughs> My friend Steve Strogatz, who's a mathematician and an educator, has said to me a couple of times, you know, the, the trouble with a lot of lectures is they answer questions that haven't been asked. <laughs> and here was President Obama wanting to know what the children's questions were. But actually, you know, it can go much deeper than that. It's not just what questions they come in with. But while we're explaining things to somebody, are we reading them? Are we really paying, are we relating to them? Are we seeing if they're getting it? Are we watching their body language, their tone of voice, the expressions on their faces? Are they getting it or are we just spraying information at them? Are they enjoying getting it? I think these are some of the most important questions we can ask because although it's true that if somebody's going to really study science deeply, really learn it, they're going to have to work hard at it. If we're introducing them to it, then if all we do is turn them away from it, turn them off, then it's not communication, it's excommunication. <laughs> and we can't afford to turn people off because science is coming at us faster and faster now and in greater and greater volume. And we have to understand it well enough to make decisions that affect our very existence. So I think it's very important to pay attention to the connection we have with people. That's why I was so interested in what President Obama did when he related to that boy that day. And that's how I got interested in this whole project of trying to make communication something personal, something between two people of the kind I talked about, where life happens, where something goes on between them. About 20 years ago, when I was asked if I wanted to be the host of Scientific American Frontiers, I took it really greedily because I, it was a kind of a selfish decision. I wanted to know more about science. I was hungry to know more about science. And I thought if I spend all day interviewing these scientists, I'll have a chance to really get it. Now, the amazing thing is, I actually did begin to get it. The reason I got it was because of this unusual way we had of doing the interviews. They weren't, they weren't stock interviews. I didn't ask a question and then give them a chance to answer it to the camera and then ask the next question with no relation to what they said, but just because it's the next question. I didn't do that. It was an open-ended improvisational conversation because my goal was not to toss them softballs that they could hit out of the park. My goal was to understand what they were saying. And I wouldn't give up till I understood it. I grabbed them sometimes by the lapels. I don't get it. What are you saying? Tell me again. <laughs> and something would happen then if they, most of the time they responded immediately to that. But if they had been in lecture mode before it, 
when they saw that this person, this human being standing right next to them really wanted to understand it, I saw the tone of voice change, the vocabulary changed, they were personal, they were really trying to help me get it. And we sometimes would have to go through it three, four times till I got it. But there was a human connection and they were so available to me that they were available therefore to the audience watching at home. And I think when I got it, they got it. So there was a, a real dynamic interaction that had some of this life I'm talking about. So when the show was over, I had this thought. I, I, I thought, what if we could help scientists achieve this open channel that we had during the interviews? If they could have that with their audience when they're talking to the public or whoever they're talking to. And I thought back on my own life and I thought, what really gave me the ability to do that was studying improvisation. And I thought, what if we teach scientists improvisation? Not comedy improvisation, but the very basic, pure kind of improvisation that is concentrated on the connection between the two players. And then the hope was, if they got accustomed to this connection with the other player, the other scientists they were playing these improv games with, when they turned to an audience, they'd have that same connection. And we experimented, first with some graduate students, and then with uh, scientists, uh, graduate students at Stony Brook University, and it worked. And now at the Alda Center, it's the basis of all we teach as we teach communication. First, we teach improvisation, but even when we're teaching distilling your message, getting it down to its essence, making people understand what the essence of it is and why they should care about it. Or when we're teaching writing, how to write an op-ed piece. We start the writing classes with improv exercises because we want to reinforce the idea that you're not just spraying out information, you're actually making contact with another person. It's your mind and their mind. I want to, I want to show you an example of what I'm talking about. It, because it, it, hearing it is not the same thing as seeing it. And by the way, doing it is even better. So if you get a chance to do this, please leap at it. It's, it's amazing because you realize this is different from what it sounded like. It's not being funny and it's not being quick on your feet. It's connecting. So I want to show you a video of a young scientist that we worked with. And this, this video, this is two parts. First part was before he took five sessions of improv. And then speaking about the same subject after the five sessions of improv. But in between, we didn't coach him on changing what he had to say. Anything he says in both videos came out of him. But first, without just studying the improv, and then after. See if you see a difference in those two videos. You want to play the video for us? So my name is Stephen. I'm a PhD candidate in the geosciences department. And I love geology because it allows you to go out and look at environments over time, like being able to go out and look at, stand on rocks that represent you know, anoxic oceans 150 million years ago, or you know, the first biologic life a couple billion years ago. Um, and I have the pleasure of working on the coolest rocks in the solar system. They come from Mars. And over time, Mars has been struck by asteroids. And Eventually, over time, if you have a big enough impact, you can not only hit the ground, you can toss stuff up, move it around, but you can also eject it off the surface of the planet. It, you know, moves around in orbit, outer space, and eventually, Earth encounters that chunk, and the gravitational field of the Earth pulls it in, and it survives through the Earth's atmosphere, lands on the ground, and we found it, and by measuring the gas in little bubbles inside these rocks, we found that it matches not the gas you would find on Earth, but Martian atmosphere. You see a difference? I see a tremendous difference. And the way, the way he phrased it, the, the things he mentioned, the things he talked about were different because, not because somebody said, mention this, concentrate on that. It was because he was habituated to making contact and he wanted to make the best contact he could. The energy, the authenticity, the, the passion that came out was so interesting to me and we need to hear that. One of the moments I love is when he says it, it, the, the fragment came through the atmosphere and it hit the earth and we found it. <laughs> Do I remember that? I love that because 
what, what improvising does is it not only makes you aware of what's happening in the other person, it makes you aware of what's happening in yourself. He didn't know he was going to say, and we found it. But he loved saying it, and we loved hearing him say it. There was an unexpected moment there. It's hard to take your eyes off somebody who's doing these unexpected things because they're alive to that moment and you're alive to their being alive. And we need to see that passion. We need to see that energy. We deserve to see it, those of us in the public, because science belongs to all of us. Science is beautiful. Science is a great, it's a great detective story. It's poetry, it's music. Not only the whales sing, Gravity waves make the universe sing. We're entitled to be in, to be in on that story. But you know, we, we don't always understand what scientists are telling us, we out there in the public, because we haven't spent our lives learning the lingo. We've had other things we had to devote our lives to. We've been busy learning other things. Some of us are in the arts. Some of us are in business. Some of us are in Congress. <laughs> I was talking to a member of Congress once, and I was just pouring my heart out about how important the communication of science is. And he stopped me right in the middle. He said, you don't know the half of it. He says, I was at a committee meeting once, at a, a panel, where there was a table and there were members of Congress on this side of the table, and on the other side of the table were scientists, and they were all asking us for a lot of money, and they were telling us what they were going to spend the money on. And the members of Congress were passing notes to each other that said things like, do you know what this guy is saying? <laughs> now, this is tragic. This doesn't have to happen. The reason it happens is that those folks on the other side of the table that day were suffering from something that we all, at one time or another, all of us in every field, we suffer from. And that's the curse of knowledge which you probably have heard is starting to get more traction now, this idea. The curse of knowledge, it's a strange expression because why, why should knowledge be a curse? It's good to have knowledge. But the knowledge is a curse when you understand something in such detail, in such depth, and in all its complexity, you understand it so well that you forget what it's like to understand it that deeply, and you speak a language that the person's just not gonna get. But it's amazing how much, you know, science is amazing to me that with such, such a little bit of data, they can come to far reaching and deep conclusions. It's just, it's wonderful to see that. And it really is, it's interesting how little has to be uh, said. Can I, I wanna show you something. Can I, can I ask you to be a volunteer for something? Yeah, come on up. That's very generous of you, thank you. Come on up, yeah, come on. I wasn't changing my mind at all. No. Thank you. Hi, what, Nancy, thank you very much. Alan, hi, nice to meet you. Now, I'm gonna show you something. This, you're gonna be great, you can't miss it, this, so don't worry about it. Um, I'm gonna show you three songs. They're very well-known songs. And I just, I got them here, but I gotta find it, one second. Oh, here it is. These are very well known. Come on over here. Um, can you actually read this? <laughs> no, you, I'll get it up so you can read it. Isn't this exciting? <laughs> <laughs> this is so great. It, my, it's here, don't worry about it. Okay, now I'm going to get it up in a minute. Wait a minute. It should be here. This is so bad. I'm going to whisper the songs in your ear. Okay. One 
and is the Star Spangled Banner, and is my country, tis of thee, you know, and is America, all beautiful, spacious guys, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, don't say anything out loud, don't hum, don't say words. The idea is, Nancy's going to communicate one of these songs to you. I don't know which one it is. She's going to pick a song. She's going to communicate it to you just by tapping the rhythm of the song. For instance, you can hear that, right? If it was Oh Susanna, it's not going to be Oh Susanna. <laughs> if it was Oh Susanna, it would be Oh Susanna, oh, the, oh, but without the singing, right? Okay, so that, she's going to communicate the song to you, and you're going to forget it. Don't say it out loud. We'll ask you later. So, tap for us. Okay. So, okay, so that's a very well-known song. What, uh, I suppose. What, uh, <laughs> I gave you one more. So, uh, what, um, what, just roughly speaking, what percentage do you think of, of the audience will, will, will get it? Ten. T two. Ten. Ten to <laughs> Not two. Very many. Not very many. Um, how many um, people think you know? Don't say, just raise your hand. One, one, two, three, four, five. Five, six, looks like about 10 people. And I get, that's actually pretty good. And you're, now this is very interesting. Your estimate was very close to what it, what it usually is. This, was, this, has, this is a study started by a graduate student at, at Stanford about 20 years ago, I think. And it's been done thousands of times. Most of the time, probably because you're a very realistic person in science. <laughs> Most of the time, the average that they guess is 50% of the audience will get it. And I've heard it go as high as 80%. Mm. And all the thousands of times it's been done, the average is 2.5%. <laughs> Thank you very much for showing that to us. Thank you. <laughs> So here's the thing. When you're tapping out the tune and you're not, say, you're not delivering the melody out loud, the odd thing is it seems almost impossible for you not to hear the melody in your head. You have information that they don't have, but you assume they have it. This is all at an unconscious level. And that's the essence of the curse of knowledge that you know something that you assume the other people know. And this is, I think, a really interesting demonstration of it because the person tapping, in most cases, in your case, you were really sharp and you said 10%, two, two, maybe down to 2%. You really had it, you almost nailed it. But we're stuck with only getting a mere fraction of what we need to get to be engaged by science if all you tell us is the bare facts and you don't let us in on the melody. The melody is the story. The melody is the emotion. We need to hear that to be engaged by it. You know, in the Flame Challenge, the person who won the first year's contest wrote a song and did an animated video. And the song had all kinds of hard words in it like pyrolysis and chemo, chemo luminescence. <laughs> However, the song had a delightful, engaging melody, and the kids who reported back to us about that entry said, I love that song. I sang it all day long. It came through my head even when I didn't want it to because the melody was so engaging. And I, I learned all these words, and it's my favorite song about pyrolysis. <laughs> So please think about giving us the melody and the story when you tell us about science. Things are getting better. There's pretty much of a movement now around the country and around the world to make science communication at the forefront of, of, of what we're doing. But real communication, 
clarity, bringing clarity to the, to the science that we present to the public, to the public, to funders, and even to other scientists. Because if we're not in the same field, two scientists not in the exact same field, sometimes not in the exact same lab, often use the same words differently or don't understand one another's concepts or processes. And it doesn't hurt to clarify it. I'm not talking about dumbing it down. We avoid dumbing it down as much as we can. Clarity, I don't think science has been hurt ever by too much clarity. So I urge you, if you, this is so important to me, I hope you won't mind if I make this a kind of a call to action because I think we're living through a kind of a slow burning emergency. And if you haven't devoted yourself in any way to making science communication better, I urge you to please think about that. Maybe join us in our effort to train in, in the long range to train graduate students who will become the next generation of communicators. We train them while they're graduate students. We give them a practice at it all during their, their courses. And then when they graduate, they're not only accomplished scientists, they're also accomplished communicators. But we're also working, because it's an emergency, we're also working with senior scientists who are communicating now and who are often expert at it, but they know they can get better and they want to get better. And they do get better. It's a very exciting thing because great things can happen if we actually relate to the audience, if we listen to what they're thinking while we talk to them, if we read their minds, if we're present with them. But we have to be related to them. We have to connect with them. I'll tell you one last story before I end. I was on vacation with my family. We were in the Virgin Islands, and I was taking a walk with my grandson, Teo, who was about six years old at the time. And we're walking down this path that's gorgeous. We'd never seen the trees and the bushes and the flowers like this ever before. And at one point on the path, there's this skinny tree that we'd never seen before. It's a tall, thin trunk with spiky, sharp things coming out all up and down the trunk. It was amazing. And Teo said, Grandpa, look at that tree. How did that tree get that way? And I thought, oh my God, this is so great. He's asking me about evolution. <laughs> so we sat on the ground and I explained as much as I could to him about adaptation and natural selection. We talked for 45 minutes, it was glorious. And the next day he was swimming with his cousin and he asked her a question and she said, you know, that sounds like a science question. Why don't you ask grandpa? He said, I'm not making that mistake again. <laughs> Thank you.